basically induced entropy and we showed that entropy was a state function very similar to internal energy and very similar to the impulse free energy. It's a little bit different in as much as uh, the entropy is always increasing in a closed, isolated system that undergoes a spontaneous transition. You can have a transition in which there's no change in entropy, but that cannot be spontaneous. So it has to be something that, that those two states are essentially equivalent and you have to come in from the outside and make a change. If you think of it as uh, moving a block on a, on a flat table, you can, you know, the, the system is it's not gonna move, but an outside force can move it. And if done in a very careful fashion, there's no change in entropy. However, if you draw the box so that now I'm included in the system, then the entropy increases because my body uh, will necessarily have a change in entropy as I change the position of the table. So when people talk about the entropy of the universe always increasing, it's because our fundamental assumption is that our universe is a closed, isolated system, and there's really no, nothing outside the universe that can reach inside and move it around. So, where we were. We had a internal energy, and our internal energy is a function of entropy and volume. U equals T DS minus V V. So you got gas. Remember, in time that you work with real systems, you're going to have to figure out what your definition of work is and re step through your understanding of what energy, uh, enthalpy, etc. are. And include the relevant terms, for example, chemical potential or electric field, stress strain, etc. So, in a system such as this, where we define uh, our state function, uh, in terms of u. This type of system uh, evolves I'll say that it evolves and in the process of evolving it evolves such that S to the maximum it evolves This uh, results in u is a u is a minimum. So if you have a system where you've got u versus whatever variables, and you find that located here, it's going to spontaneously evolve down toward that minimum in the uh, internal energy. So this is one state variable, we have another state variable. I uh, call the enthalpy. H, uh, we find H is equal to U plus W. Actually, 
it's actually this uh, delta H, our change in the enthalpy was a change in the internal energy plus the work. Uh, again, assuming an ideal gas, this left is right. V. H is equal to U plus E V. And we can substitute in this in for delta U and expand our PV to get H is equal to T. Yes, minus P E V plus P E V plus D E P. So these terms cancel, giving us V H is equal to T Yes plus D E P. And using what we remember from uh, multivariable calculus, this gives us the derivative of H with respect to S at constant pressure, dS plus the derivative of H with respect to P at constant entropy, P. Meaning that now H is a function of entropy and pressure. So that's another state variable. And what we just did here, this is called the Legendre transform. Where we essentially took the system, or yeah, we're taking uh, one function which is a function of S and V, and we're transforming it into an equivalent function, but we change the coordinate system to S and E. And that's what all the different expressions for free energy are. We're essentially taking our internal energy, which I've heard third time I took thermo, in grad school, because every time a different professor taught them, I would take it from them. Uh, I've heard the third time uh, someone describe this internal energy function as the single most important equation in thermodynamics. I don't know if I agree with that, but it is the origin for all of our expressions for free energy, because we essentially take this, apply a series of Legendre transforms, and get enthalpies, uh, Helmholtz free energies, and uh, Gibbs free energies. So, for example, going to green, which is the natural color for Helmholtz free energy. Not really, it's the natural color for toxic gas. But uh, we'll go with Helmholtz free energy for now. Find A equal to U minus TS, meaning the A is equal to DU minus T DS minus S DT, substituting DU, we get the A is equal to T. Ds minus P, Dv minus T, Ds minus S, Dt. And that was cancel, leaving us with the A is equal to negative S, Dt minus P, Dv is equal to 
partial of A with respect to temperature and constant volume, dt plus the derivative of A with respect to volume at constant temperature, dv. And A is a function of temperature and volume, which is the Helmholtz free energy. a little bit more useful than energy and enthalpy uh, because we're not looking at entropy as uh, one of our control variables. And lastly, well, lastly for this lecture, the truth of the matter is every time that you are working, you should be thinking about what your variables are and what a reasonable expression of the state function is for what you want. DG is equal to DU minus T. Ds minus s dt plus d dv plus d dp, and substituting in du, we get dg is equal to negative s dt plus d dp is equal to the partial of g with respect to temperature at constant pressure, dt plus the partial of g with respect to pressure at constant temperature, dp, which gives us that g is a function of temperature and pressure, and this is our Gives free energy. Again, all of this is defined for a single component of non interacting ideal gas. Moving to something else with stress and strain, you're going to want to add plus other stuff in there so that. At the end of the day, you have uh, what you need. <clears throat> so this is where our expressions for uh, free energies come from. And we like Gibbs a lot in material science because temperature and pressure are variables that we can work with. Uh, it's not to say that it's the best, just many times the most convenient for what we're doing. We're talking about Gibbs three energies. We're talking about Gibbs three energies. They have a certain stability criteria, and I'm not going to prove this. I'm just going to tell you that the stability criteria uh, is that. Gibbs free energy curve has to be concave up. Meaning that you've got some Gibbs free energy versus some thermodynamic variable, whatever that happens to be. Uh, Looks like that. In these regions, stable and in this region which is unstable uh, also the Gibbs free energy 
uh, drives toward <coughs> the minimum. So we start in our system here. It's going to drive itself to that minimum. So we start here and drive itself to that minimum. This being the lowest is our global minimum. And if our system is able to sample phase space, for example, the, the gas molecules in the air are pretty free to move around, they'll tend to go toward the global minimum. Uh, in other cases, we can get ourselves stuck in local minimum. Uh, and at that point, we've created a, a metastable system. Metastable systems are extremely important if our universe is always tended toward the uh, global minimum without uh, getting stuck in this local minimum. Uh, it would be first off boring and uh, second off not very useful, especially for things like humans, which are inherently metastable and are constantly uh, out of equilibrium. We're not seeing up through the room. Uh, so uh, this is a big thing in material science, and it's really about kinetics, which is a class that I'm uh, hoping to propose, uh, the graduate level kinetics class. That I look at what we've got in our curriculum right now. We've got the thermal class, we don't have uh, kinetics and materials for phase transitions, and we also don't have the Fermi rings. So I think that'd be something to be useful to, uh, to propose. That's another story. So going back to uh, uh, this gives free energy, and this is going to be a little bit of a precursor. At some point, uh, later, we're going to talk about uh, gives free energy. G is equal to H minus T S. So basically, we're going to take our uh, work terms here and uh, express them as in, uh, enthalpy right now. So we've got all of these expressions now, and I'll write them out. U. T ds minus e v h is equal to t ds plus v p a is equal to negative s t minus p v and v g is equal to minus s t plus v p. Okay. So we can take these and we can take our uh, expressions for these using our uh, partial derivatives. And get what's called the Maxwell relations. Basically, we're using T is equal to the partial of enthalpy with respect to entropy with constant pressure. Right, so that's from here. That gives us this. And we can relate that to is equal to the partial of u with respect to entropy at constant b, which is coming from here. So 
one of the maximum relations gives us the relationship between the derivative of u with respect to entropy and the derivative of uh, enthalpy. Similarly, we have negative a b t equals p equals negative partial of u with respect to b at constant s negative of partial divs with respect to temperature at constant pressure is equal to s is equal to negative partial of a with respect to temperature at constant volume and the derivative of gibbs with respect to pressure at constant temperature is equal to the volume is equal to the partial of enthalpy with respect to pressure at constant entropy. So these are uh, Maxwell relations and again all of these are derived for uh, an ideal single component non-interacting non gas a lot of the things, well, there's a, a chapter in your textbook, and I can't remember which one it is. It's four, possibly, or three. Uh, it's basically a whole chapter which is devoted to going through Maxwell relations. Now, it must be, it must be chapter five, I think. Uh, and they're useful, but they only give you these for ideal gases. In your system, you'll have a whole series of these that include things such as stresses and strains. And that's uh, one to be useful for you. And writing these out give, it gives you a, a set of tools that you can use to, uh, to relate them to each other. So, let me I'll see what I'm saying here. This next step. Okay. So beyond the Maxwell relations, we can talk about the second derivatives. Uh, the second derivatives of our functions. So, for example, if we have some function z, which is a function of x and y, then the derivative of z is equal to, or sorry, the uh, infinitesimal dz is equal to the partial of z with respect to x, the constant y dx, plus the partial of z with respect to y at constant x. And these terms then can be written as functions of x and y. Oops, uh, z dy are on the right. I will say m x y and we can take each so these are our functions that are you know equivalent to our uh, you know s and d uh, here we can also take these functions which are the derivatives of our uh, this end here our thermodynamic potential and take the derivative of those so we can say for example dl dy at constant x is equal to partial of y partial of z with respect to x y and x or we write the m x at constant y is equal to the partial with respect to x the partial of z with respect to y at constant x constant y because the state state function Mathematically, these two then can be set equal to each other. So this is also kind of one of those neat math tricks that come about because of having a state function. And we talked about this in the, in the second lecture. 
So as a result of that, we have that So we have this. And what's important about that is it means that if we come over and we take, for example, uh, U, and we have uh, these, we could say that the partial of temperature with respect to volume constant entropy is equal to negative the partial of pressure with respect to entropy at constant volume. So this uh, mathematical truth, if you will, uh, allows us to take apart uh, the derivatives inside our thermodynamic functions and set them equal as well. So this gives you another set of substitutions uh, that are, are sometimes useful. So, all this okay? A lot of it's just math, but the trick of the math is that it gives you what you need to manipulate your, your functions. All right. Where I think we have problems in thermodynamic education is that a lot of it assumes that you remember your multivariable calculus, which no one does, uh, including me. Uh, and the second is, is that uh, it's not taught, I think, in a way that shows you that, well, there's some very simple mathematical rules that let you take all of these uh, apart. And then essentially, we start out with this internal energy in which we take in whatever we define work as in our system, and then everything else just falls through from derivatives. So let's talk a little bit about other types of work. And in particular, we're going to talk about uh, what I think is one of the most important forms of work for material scientists, important and simple. Uh, stress and strain are incredibly important, but stress and strain are second order tensors in the relationship between them and the fourth order tensor, which means that when we start writing things out, it becomes extremely hairy, extremely quickly. There's a guy named Wallace that wrote a book called uh, Thermodynamics of Crystals. Maybe it's Thermodynamics of Solids, I can't remember. But the whole tract is, is just one big set of tensors. Uh, it's painful to go through, but if that's your field, crystallography and stress strain in anisotropic crystals, uh, it's useful. But here we're going to talk about something useful, which is a little bit simpler, and this has to do with thermodynamic, uh, with uh, chemical work. So we have our du is equal to del q minus del w, and this work we said was everything not heat, and we're going to introduce another wall. Sort of, well, we've already done this. Uh, we're going to have a permeable wall, meaning that we can add or remove content. And I, I call this chemical work. That comes in the form of mu dn. 
So this mu is a chemical potential. And Bn is the number of, or the amount of stuff, I should call it. Had it removed from my perspective as, as a as a quantum theorist, I think of N as number of atoms or number of electrons. But you can also work in units of uh, moles, or if you really want to hurt yourself, you can work in, in units of uh, mass or volume. But uh, oftentimes, I'll just talk about number of atoms being added. It's also a lot easier to think about, uh, especially starting at this uh, beginning of the course. So if you have this, When we go through our Legendre transform, we line up with Gibbs free energy that now looks like this. Good. Green is the natural color of Helmholtz, but uh, I could say. So I immediately change notation of it. Let's So this is our expression for Gibbs free energy, or the change in the Gibbs free energy. Uh, when we have this, then that is our negative S. That is our E. That is our chemical potential. In the derivatives, I've got the mark as constant pressure and constant number of atoms for each of these. The final term, we're summing over all of the different constituents in the system. And in that sum, we're going from one to n, so there's n different types of uh, constituents. And we're holding constant all of the elements, or pressure, temperature, and all the elements except for the element of interest. So when n equals 3, this is going to be you know, 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, da, 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 n. Skipping 3. So this is what our uh, expression of Gibbs looks like. And 
you'll see this uh, later. Is everything okay with this so far? Any questions? Okay. Oh, should I? How many of you are material scientists and have seen all of this before? Material scientists, but we have all that we've seen. Okay. Is any of this new? Mm. All of it's new. <laughs> all of it's new. <laughs> okay. Our, our undergrads don't want to not go this deep in, yeah. into this sort of topic. Okay. I mean, we went. We did a very superficial. Gibbs is T delta or T times. You've seen the simplified final yeah. equations. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I always <laughs> worry that I'm I'm boring people because they're so quiet and no one's sleeping, which it's also early in the morning and everyone's had coffee recently. Uh, just but, wait. Just wait a month. Wait a month. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wait. Wait till the end of the week. We've got a proposal due on Thursday, so for the next few days we're gonna be. Uh, Carrier, but uh, okay. So look at this expression, and apparently. When I designed the notes for this class, I thought this was an appropriate time to go back and then uh, discuss about taking the derivatives of thermodynamic potentials. The derivatives of thermodynamic potentials. Uh, this is where kind of the action is, or where the rubber beats the road. Uh, this is the stuff that is actually measurable. So we've got our Gibbs free energy, the G to negative S T plus T dp. If we take the first derivative of the Gibbs free energy, we get the thermodynamic variables S and V. So the partial of Gibbs with respect to temperature at constant pressure is equal to negative S, and the partial of Gibbs with respect to pressure at constant temperature is volume. Great. And those are useful, but what's more useful is when we start taking the second derivatives. So the second derivative, change the blue here. Second derivative of Gibbs potential with respect to temperature is equal to negative second derivative of entropy with respect to temperature and constant pressure. So that's from here. That is equal to negative second uh, derivative of enthalpy respect to temperature, 1 over T, and that's equal to negative dP T. So this seven here comes about because we have dH is equal to T dS plus V dP. So we use one of the, one of the uh, one of the Maxwell relations to form a substitution of S for H over T. Question. For the second derivative of Gibbs, do we have to hold the pressure constant? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, here. Okay. But for the, the second derivative of Gibbs with respect to... Oh, you mean here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's not the condition. So okay. uh, basically I, I did a substitution of uh, uh, D, T, T. So this is supposed to be D, T. Okay. 
So this became this. Yeah. Yeah, I, I a lot of times in my notation, I, I wind up dropping those and I just let you assume that these are, are held constant because they are. Uh, this notation becomes significant when you start having more variables than you can keep track of, or you're comparing, for example, two different uh, uh, expressions for the, the thermodynamic potentials that have a different variable set. And that's the second derivative of enthalpy, right? Uh, the to temperature. Which one? The third, third term. Third term. Yeah, that's enthalpy. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah. the second derivative. It's the first derivative. First. Okay. So that's, that's the first derivative of enthalpy with respect to temperature. By uh, multiply by one over temperature, okay. and that uh, is comes from a substitution. Uh, I step through it. Actually, wrote it down my notes. Or not? Because uh, I thought you said second. second oh, no, first. Because we're using uh, we're using H S equals T for that, which means that then we do. T H D S D S H one D T D H D T D S D H T T. So you basically take D S by D T multiplied by one. Recognize that one can also be expressed as dh divided by dh, ds divided by ds. So, and then changing the parentheses, the ds cancel out, giving you dh by dt, ds by dh, so dh by dt, uh, which we substitute in, and then ds by dh becomes our one t. This is the type of math that mathematicians hate, but it works so well. Uh, okay. It's amazing how much strictly bad math engineers and physicists do, and it works out right. Uh, so we've got we've got the heat capacities. Well, you know what, I'm gonna just call this CP, not C dash P, because I'm we can build it, we can change it to a more quantity layer if we want to, but I'm gonna leave it kind of like that for now. Uh, AT, the isothermal compressibility, take it to one over D, 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 the constant temperature, and uh, isothermal compressibility. And alpha d to the one over d d t d this is isobar isobar thermal scattering. So using these. Partial, the second partial of Gibbs with respect to pressure is equal to dv dp constant temperature equal to v at and second derivative of Gibbs with respect to pressure with respect to temperature is equal to second derivative of Gibbs with respect to temperature, with respect to pressure. This is the definition of the state function. We can switch the order of the derivative. And this tells us that dS dP constant temperature is equal to dV dT constant pressure is equal to the 
alpha. So we've got an expression for the thermal expansion. So what this means in practical terms is that if you're able to make, so for an ideal single component, ideal gas, if you're able to make measurements of heat capacity, uh, compressibility, and uh, thermal coefficient of expansion, you can then take and integrate those and get the state function. And if you have the state function, then you know everything there is to know about the state of the system. And also, if you happen to have that function, you can talk about how it changes, how it evolves, where the minimum and maximum are, where you, know, you can find the local minimum to track the system. Uh, and if you have this from multiple different uh, Configurations. We might even talk about, and we'll talk about this later. For example, comparing uh, the liquid phase to the gaseous phase, you can talk about the difference in free energy, where they cross each other, and if they do cross each other, what the difference is, which is going to be the driving force for uh, solidification or uh, vaporization, etc. All is okay. Great. Well, we'll call it a day at that, and uh, next time we'll talk about uh, free energy, and we'll look at uh, free energy as a function of temperature, and what else can I do? Not to give away all the surprises, but uh, yeah, comparison of, of different phases and uh, latent heats.